Uh, all our friends and colleagues, uh, participants uh, in this, uh, in this uh, webinar. I'm delighted to be here to participate in this very important ongoing global conversation and to you know, fit Nigeria's, uh, Nigeria's own priorities for uh, our co post-COVID-19 recovery into the uh, global context of um, post-COVID recovery. Uh, they, there, there's no question at all that um, the devastation wrought by the COVID-19 pandemic on business, on production, on learning, on travel, and on practically every phase out of life has set us all back, you know, uh, tremendously. But at the same time, you know, uh, it has also created uh, in, uh, incredible opportunities. And there are certain areas, uh, I'll, I'll be focusing on uh, about four or, five, four or five areas, beginning with uh, uh, public health and how uh, in the area of public health we, and uh, generally healthcare, uh, we intend to respond and build on what um, we've learned uh, in the past one year. As with other nations, uh, the, the, the pandemic tested the integrity of our systems uh, and in charting our way forward and designing our, our nation's post-pandemic future, especially in the health area, we are clearly uh, building on, uh, we are clearly going to be building on some of uh, the learn some of the experiences that, that we've had so far. Now, what we did beginning uh, in about April or May was uh, to develop an economic sustainability plan, a short-term strategy formulated to address the twofold challenge posed by the, uh, by the plague to both public health and the national economy. So in practical terms, uh, this meant creating resilience in the health sector to ensure that we could respond to crises like this in the future, as well as saving and creating new jobs by stimulating local production across several sectors. So I'll be talking you know, about our public health response as well as, of course, the economy, and we'll, we'll be talking again about some other areas, uh, including climate change and energy security, et cetera. But um, uh, the, the uh, economic sustainability plan uh, was, uh, as I said, our um, short-term plan for being able to respond to the crisis, but we also realized that it will be a bridge to uh, some of what we intended to do in the future. The first recorded case of COVID-19 um, was for us in February, tw well, February 20th was, yes, and, this, and what happened immediately, again, pointed to some of the areas of our public health system that we could actually build on. So when, uh, we, uh, when that patient was identified, a sample of the virus was sent to our Africa Center of Excellence for Genomics and Infectious Diseases at the Redeemers University in Oshun State, Nigeria. There, a team led by Professor Christian Happy analyzed the sample and they were able to, within 48 hours, share the very first genome sequence of the severe acute respiratory syndrome, coronavirus 2, from Africa with the global science community. Now, the speed with which the test samples were analyzed helped us calibrate the measures that we thought would be necessary to curb uh, the spread of the pandemic. But uh, the, the, the interesting point here was that um, we had some capacity to be able to at least, you know, uh, 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 quickly put together the genomic sequence of the disease. But that capacity had always been ignored until the, the, this arose. Yes, there was a bit of work done on Ebola and all of that, but we had practically ignored this. So one of the critical areas for us going forward, obviously, is in doing far more with our research institutions and investing far more in our research institutions. And I think I, I might say a few things about that as we go, as we go on. But since February 2020, we've significantly ramped up our testing and case management capacity 
Uh, we've activated from about five uh, 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 molecular laboratories to about 120 molecular laboratories, most of them public lab uh, laboratories. We've expanded the footprint of our sovereign public health response capabilities, especially at the sub-national level, and in areas where such capabilities simply didn't exist before. But going forward, we are committed to building on the exemplary dedication of our health workers and strengthening the capacity of our health system to withstand shocks created by uh, infectious uh, diseases and pandemics uh, such as we experienced. So in this regard, we are promoting a culture of preparedness across all levels of our healthcare sector. And one reason why we've been able to manage this pandemic, I think, better than expected is that we did have some existing public se sector infrastructure to work with. So the Ebola outbreak of 2014, our ongoing battles with Lassa fever, our successes with polio eradication, helped us to tighten our epidemic contingency plans, strengthen our emergency coordination and surveillance capacities, and also helped us, and also, of course, uh, uh, enhanced investments in public health uh, laboratories. So one of the key lessons that we learned from our response to the Ebola outbreak was the need to build uh, systems in peacetime, if you like, that can be used during uh, outbreaks of this kind. Our National Center for Disease Control, the Nigeria Center for Disease Control, which was founded in 2011, was made independent uh, in 2018 as we prioritize the strengthening of our public health infrastructure. But while it's true that in many respects, uh, hospital infrastructure still lags behind uh, the standards, especially in, in richer countries of the world, we've been able to draw on the resilience and adaptability of our tried and tested community health systems. So for example, we were able to very quickly repurpose the teams that had been deployed to communities to vaccinate children against polio, to conduct enlightenment can, uh, campaigns in communities about the, new, uh, about the new pandemic. The pandemic has asked tough questions of our national capabilities, uh, as I said, in the area of research and innovation. And I must say uh, that we, rep we responded quite uh, gamely uh, to, these, um, to these issues. Last December, the Nigerian Institute of Medical Research launched a new set of COVID-19 test kits that could produce results in 57 minutes. Uh, the new kit was designed by Joseph Shaibu, a molecular, a molecular viro vir virologist at the, uh, at the NMI, NIMR. By the end of the year, the Center of Excellence in Oshun State, which, is the first, uh, which, uh, which was the first to sequence the genome of the uh, SARS-CoV-2, uh, 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 will inaugurate the biggest genomics research center in Africa. And earlier this year, the center was selected by the Broad Institute of the MIT and Harvard University to be part of a prestigious scientific coalition that will help set up an early warning system to prevent and respond to future outbreaks and pandemics. So we are prioritizing local research and development and investing in the efforts of our scientists and innovators to, de uh, to develop solutions in pharmaceuticals and medical consumables. Uh, of course, to, 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 to support this, um, the government set up the Healthcare Sector Intervention Fund, which is about a $185 million uh, disbursement to finance the acquisition and installation of critical medical equipment. And uh, we also have uh, a $609 million uh, disbursement also to uh, the, uh, the, the, this is to the health sector in particular uh, for um, generic produc uh, production of, uh, sorry, the production of generic drugs. And, you know, uh, also development of our vaccine uh, production capacity. So there are quite a few uh, developments which we think uh, as a result of, uh, of the, our experiences in the past year. And I think that uh, in particular, the uh, research um, efforts have benefited greatly from, uh, uh, from, from this, um, from the, from the uh, uh, 
uh, aftermath of the of the pandemic. So uh, I I just want to mention you know as uh, just to close this bit about public health you know the need for vaccine uh, multilateralism uh, as part of our. Recovery efforts. Nigeria has taken delivery of about four million doses of the COVID-19 vaccines under the international COVAX scheme, and we commenced uh, the vaccination of uh, of, of our people. Uh, this year, we'll receive 84 million doses of the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine under that same scheme, which will be enough to vaccinate about 20% of our population. However, these efforts and those of other African countries are proceeding under the specter of vaccine nationalism. And there are justifiable concerns, in my view, about the certainty of fair and equitable access to vaccines, as well as the likelihood that poorer countries may be left behind if the distribution of these vaccines is determined by you know, the nationalistic sentiments that we're seeing uh, all over the place at the moment. We must be particularly concerned about the securitization of global health, that tendency to, conf uh, to conflate global public health with national security and geopolitical calculations at the expense of the multilateral collaboration required to um, worldwide uh, vaccine coverage. So I think that in our globalized environment, national self-interest alone is insufficient to address the challenge of a global pandemic. Indeed, in a world as interconnected as ours has become, uh, anything that um, is, any, any, any uh, plan other than uh, a global plan is bound to be counterproductive. So I'll just go uh, uh, quickly to, um, the, to, to the economy and some of the uh, some of what we've done, especially uh, first response to uh, the uh, pandemic and uh, to the fallout of the pandemic. So our, our first priority, of course, was to protect people and their livelihoods. And about 50% of our economy is driven by the MSME sector. And one of the specific interventions under the, under the Economic Sustainability Plan was what we described as a survival fund which uh, essentially was a fund to protect jobs uh, and to ensure that during the course of the pandemic and immediately thereafter, um, informal workers in particular, or private sector workers, especially those in the informal sector, had, were at least able to continue to earn, uh, uh, earn, earn some wages. So through this initiative, we're able to support uh, in the first uh, phase over 300,000 businesses by providing salaries for three months uh, for uh, beneficiaries. Now the beneficiaries included private school teachers. Uh, now they're, you know, uh, and the reason of course is that public school teachers continue to earn salaries even during the, 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 the lockdowns. But private school teachers obviously uh, were not uh, as fortunate. So government supported uh, private school teachers, road transporters also, taxis, especially uh, commercial tricycle operators in the urban areas. They also came under the survival fund scheme for a three month period. We also sought to protect the most vulnerable, in particular the urban poor, who also of course were, hard, were very hard hit so, to, so what we did was to provide direct cash transfers uh, to uh, the urban poor under many of them who are under um, uh, who are in uh, uh, our social register. Now, the first phase of that, we were able to benefit about one million beneficiaries, and um, we're now in a position uh, using the same social register to scale up the program to about 20 million beneficiaries. In addition to this, we also focused on um, underpinning infrastructure to provide a multiplier effect for resilience in the future. We found that to reach people, to provide support, to keep the economy open and people at work, we needed to have certain things in place, especially data. 
So we accelerated our broadband program, our broadband connectivity program, by reducing the cost of laying broadband infrastructure and extending penetration to unserved and underserved areas. So the plan is to deliver data download speeds across the country of a minimum of 25 MBPs in urban areas and 10 MBPs in rural areas, with an effective coverage available to at least 90% of the population. Uh, our projection was by 2025, but with some of the work that's already been done, we expect that we could actually conclude by 2023 and at a price of not more than 390 Naira per one uh, gigabyte of data, which is 1% of the minimum wage and 2% of median income. So we've recorded uh, the mileage increase, uh, mileage increase of fiber optic cabling from about 47,000 kilometers now to just under 55,000 kilometers, representing a 10% increase over a one year period. So really, you know, the, uh, the, the pandemic, I think, uh, you know, was instrumental in our being able to move faster on our broadband connectivity program. The other program which we've worked on uh, is also the national identification program. So we've expanded the provision of national identification numbers by partnering with telecoms companies. Our aim is to issue national identification numbers to every Nigerian. And uh, our target is by the end of 2022. So far, we've covered about uh, 56 million. And uh, we expect that we should be able to conclude this uh, by the end of next year. These measures will ensure that all parts of the country would have access to affordable data for both remote working and learning, and also, of course, for all of the uh, for, for all of the business um, the business opportunities that um, the that broadband connectivity uh, would of course encourage expanding our national identity base of course will also help us to identify those in need and um, this this of course will help uh, in the development of our social register and so many other uh, pro-poor programs under our social investment scheme. To stimulate production in the economy, we focused on energizing existing uh, value chains in agriculture, in construction, and renewable energy. Our, our agriculture program, and I'm talking still about the Economic Sustainability Plan, which is, as, as I said, the, the short-term plan um, the post-COVID uh, uh, during COVID and the post-COVID short-term plan. Our cultural program aims at expanding productivity, creating about, in total, about 5 million jobs. What we've done so far is that we've been able to register and geotag about 5 million um, new farmers uh, to uh, uh, farmland areas. And um, uh, the, the, the idea, of course, is also to increase land under cultivation from a, from a combination of aggregated smallholder farms and the integration of previously underutilized farm settlements. The program is supporting smallholder farmers by linking them to extension services and low interest uh, input financing. Aside from agriculture, our mass, we have a mass housing program which is designed to deliver affordable homes through uh, direct intervention in the housing construction sector aimed at creating 1.8 million jobs, together with the construction of 300,000 homes in the, first, in the first phase. Now, this is a social housing scheme, and uh, one of the priorities for us is that anyone who earns the minimum wage, uh, and who is able to spend a third of his, or who's ready to uh, expend a third of that wage on housing should be able to afford a home. So uh, this, uh, and uh, at the moment we have programs going on in 12 states. We, expand, we extend to expand to all of the states of the Federation. Uh, we've been able to build uh, and develop a home which costs just under 2 million Naira. Um, I'm not entirely certain whether that comes to in pounds, but I'm sure that uh, uh, in, in dollars, I think that would be 
about um, uh, four thousand, I think, or five thousand dollars, something like five thousand dollars. Yes. So they, so they, um, that's for the um, uh, social housing scheme. For well, medium and uh, to long term outlook uh, going forward, our priorities are to restore economic growth in the immediate term, and in the medium term to reposition the economy on a sustainable footing. Our goal is to seize the post-COVID moment, not only to save jobs, but to make the country a hub for local production, especially light manufacturing, shoes, steel fabrication, ceramics, plastics, furniture, and building materials. Even as we build domestic capacity, you know, uh, we're doing so in the knowledge that our true horizon is outward. So a, a policy imperative is the encouragement of value addition and beneficiation in every sector of the economy, especially uh, to consolidate the areas of our comparative advantage. So manufacturing, as I've said, particularly light manufacturing, holds considerable promise. And um, we, we are looking also at mining, where we think uh, beneficiation will provide tremendous opportunity. One of the ways by which we've tried to approach uh, uh, enhancing manufacturing is the establishment of special economic zones. Of course, we have some already, but we are now looking at establishing six new uh, economic uh, exports, uh, economic, special economic zones. And most of these zones, well, of course, these zones will uh, be... Um, well provisioned with, with the power and infrastructure. And uh, already we have one that will take off, we hope, by the end of the year. That's the Lekki Economic Zone. And uh, there are two others that, um, are, are in the, uh, that we expect should take off also at the very latest uh, by the last quarter of this year. Uh, recently, the president approved a 50 billion export expansion facility as part of the Economic Sustainability Plan to provide support for exporters, particularly MSMEs. So our priorities here in, really include assisting a lot of the small companies that are doing incredible work, especially in uh, food processing and packaging and in leather works, uh, garment manufacturing, etc. In, uh, in being able to export some of their products.